Are you suffering from Starfield-induced boredom? Are you tired of going through the motions, teleporting from planet to planet, menu to menu, from one procedurally generated recreation of the geography of Utica, New York to the next? Are you demotivated by the slow grind through levels and levels of inconsequential perk upgrades? Do you find yourself disinterested in the universe, the lame and vague factions, and the human-only galaxy? Then fear not, as the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind may be the change you need. Morrowind has it all. A truly unique, completely alien, yet wholly believable, cohesive world, deep lore, and factions who can trace their roots thousands of years into the past, and feature some of the most freeform, robust, and interesting RPG elements and mechanics of all time. That's right, in just one afternoon in Morrowind, you can go from a fresh off the prison boat broke Enwa, who can't even cast a lowly fire touch spell, to a living MQ-9 Reaper drone who can levitate for hours on end whilst raining down fiery death on your oppositions with your infinite magicka reserves just from chugging a couple potions. You can do all this and more in the land of Vardenfell, but just be prepared for some racism from the locals. You Enwa! But all jokes aside, Morrowind is a truly unique experience. It's Bethesda Game Studios' ultimate lightning in a bottle moment, and it still stands as their greatest achievement in the eyes of many longtime TES fans, even to this day, as it provides an experience wholly unique into itself that cannot be replicated, not even by its more powerful older siblings. And with games that are carried by their strict RPG mechanics and dice roll interactions breaking into the stratosphere of gaming popularity, <laughs> Baldur's Gate 3, and Bethesda's own latest game, Starfield, being so godforsakenly mid and forgettable, I think there's no better time to jump into Morrowind than right now. All you really need to do is adjust to the game's older presentation and design, and once you clear that overhead, you'll be able to experience one of the most unique and engrossing RPGs ever crafted. And don't you worry, Papa Kung will make sure you got all the tips and tricks you need to overcome this game's more quirky design choices. That is if you decide to take my words to heart and fire up Morrowind on your PC. And if you do, first things first, you'll want some form of graphics or conversion mod. I use MGEXE. It seems that the hip and cool thing is to use OpenMW, and there are plenty of better video tutorials if you want to go through that route. But for me, I'll be modifying the Game of the Year version of the game I bought on Steam. The reason why you'll want a graphics conversion mod is that vanilla Morrowind is a bit of a tough scene, with character models that look less like humans and elves and look more like abstract impressions of humanoids, and the draw distance is ridiculously low. The fog is coming. So once you have a graphics overhaul or an open Morrowind installed and up and running, then you can just jump right into the game from there. The first thing you need to understand about Morrowind and its gameplay is that it is a bona fide RPG. You know, major skills, minor skills, miscellaneous skills, racial skills and bonuses, rigid classes, attributes that govern player abilities and skills, chance to hit combat, the works. And it's a far cry from the action-focused, mostly perk-based progression of the later titles like Skyrim. The first thing you do after you wake up from your boat ride from the Empire to Vardenfell, and say hi to the goat jib, is to build your character and class. And if you're anything like me, going from baby brain Skyrim to tool album brain Morrowind, it'll be a lot to take in at first. And you can easily end up tagging a skill you won't end up using much at all as a major skill, or mistagging a skill you may end up wanting to use quite a bit. As in this playthrough, I foolishly didn't tag Alteration Magic, and had to spend extra money training it up to use extremely useful spells like levitation and water walking, and untagged miscellaneous skills level up slower than plate tectonic movements, and start at a base level of 5. So make sure you have a solid plan for your character's skills. Whatever skills you tag as major or minor will boost their skill numbers to start you out, and with almost all interactions in Morrowind being based on dice rolls and stat proficiencies, making sure you have the right skills is very important, otherwise you'll be whiffing and flubbing spells and attacks constantly, which is ass. So, and feel free to build your character in a different way than this, but I'd recommend you take a form of melee attack as a major skill, such as long or short blade, axe, spear, blunt weapon, and so on. And this applies to mages too, as even if you play a mage, you'll eventually run out of that blue juice in a heated battle, and will be forced to pull out the stick to finish your enemy off. You'll also want to tag one or more of mysticism, alteration, or restoration, as all these schools of magic have extremely useful spells that any class can benefit from, Mysticism has Alm Civi slash Divine Intervention spells, which will teleport you back to the nearest Tribunal Temple or Imperial Cult Temple, which is big huge in a game without a click, location, and teleport there fast travel system. Mysticism also has Mark and Recall, where you can mark the spot that you're standing on, and teleport back to that spot at a later time using the Recall spell. Alteration, like I mentioned, has Levitate and Water Walking, which is not only just cool as fuck to fly around the map and take a hike across water surfaces like old JC, 
but they're also extremely useful for getting around quicker and reaching out of normal reach areas, especially in levitate only Telvani wizard towers. And water walking ends up being much more indispensable than you think, as it's a godsend when traversing the watery areas of Azura's coast and Sheol Gorad. And if you don't have water walking, you'll have to slowly swim through it all and stop every 15 seconds to have an underwater duel with the endless horde of slaughterfish who infest the coastline. Alteration also has very useful spells like Aunt Doozy's Open Door, which gives you magical lockpicking, nullifying the need for you to invest in security, aka your lockpicking skill. As for restoration, it has all your classic healing spells and such which are universally useful, but it also has helpful spells like restore attribute spells, as you never know when that bum ass major fighting will summon a bone lord who will damage your strength, which will lower your carry weight and attack power, and will nail you to the floor where you stand with your now weak ass encumbrance. So these types of spells are always helpful to at least have, as damaged attributes will not recover until manually restored by a spell, receiving a blessing from a shrine, or drinking a potion. But overall, outside of these recommendations, You'll want to build your character around the three main TES archetypes, Warrior, Mage, or Thief, and select the skills you think you'd use the most. If you play Warrior, be sure to tag Armorer, as late game enemies will hit ridiculously hard, and your gear's durability, which it has in this game, will be shredded quickly. And it gets pretty tough. Later on in the DLCs, I was having armor pieces break just from one hit from an enemy. But luckily, repairing is an incredibly simple system. Just use an Armorer's hammer on your character, and click to roll to repair your items. You'll also want to tag Alchemy as well, as it's by far the most ridiculously powerful skill in the game, which I'll cover later. You'll see. And if your character's build ends up sucking, it's really easy to start over and build a brand new one. And Morrowind even encourages this experimentation and usage of multiple character types. Like every other Elder Scrolls game, you improve your skills by using them. And if you level up one of your major or minor skills, it'll count towards your main level progression. And after around usually 10 major and minor skill ups, you'll level up. And then you can pick three attributes to improve which can be improved up to 5 points per level, depending on which skills you improved, as all skills are governed by your attributes, which you can see by mousing over the skill in your pause menu. So for example, if you level up Longblade 10 times in a level, your strength skill will go up by 5 points, letting you power level if you want to, and the best way to do so is to pay for some cheap training and a miscellaneous skill that's governed by the attribute you want to improve, and then rest and level up when you're ready. But once your solidly built character is created, and you get out of the census office and complete the tutorial, Morrowind is pretty much completely open for you to explore, and you can strike out in any direction you want. And as you take your first steps, you'll realize, damn, I move slow as hell. Yes, even your walking speed is a skill, namely your speed, athletics, and acrobatics. And no matter if you tag athletics as a major skill or not, there is no sprint. In fact, you're probably already running, you're just that slow. But not to worry, you can hit caps lock to toggle to walk, and you'll move even slower, almost impossibly slow. Wow, we are cooking here. The movement speed is probably one of the biggest inhibitors of really getting into Morrowind, as there will be several stretches of time lost just going from place to place. Looks like we're back on our Proclaimer shit again. And that combined with the limited fast travel, as you can only use intervention, mark and recall spells, or be forced to take the Vardenfeld public transportation systems of Silt Striders, aka the bus, the Mage's Guild Guides, aka Uber, and ships, aka the water bus. And several hours of your Morrowind playtime may just be hiking and strolling through the mushroom forests and ash-covered hills and valleys. So, in the interest of time, which I value a lot, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. To permanently solve our cement shoes issue here, we need to head north of Balmora to Caldera, and go past Caldera, following the road to Aldrun. Don't take the back road, and use the signpost to know where you're going. And on the road, we can meet this Red Guard trader lady, who will give us the boots of blinding speed if we can escort her to the nearby town of Narmak which is a fairly short hike away to the west. And once you wrangle her AI over there, the follower AI in Morrowind is, uh, dicey at best. She will hand us over the boots. But if you try putting them on and you are an orc who has a natural magicka resistance, your screen will get blacked out, which makes the boots nigh on useless. But we can beat this blindness. What you'll want to do is to buy a resist magicka spell from a rail's trade house in Seda Need, which falls under restoration. Eh? Eh? Like I said. Tag it. Once you buy the spell, Head on over to the Balmora Mages Guild and find the Spellcrafter NPC. You'll then want to craft a Resist Magicka spell that casts on yourself and resists 100% Magicka for one second. Spellcrafting is probably the most missed feature in current Elder Scrolls, and it's pretty obvious why. Spellcrafting allows you to make your own custom spell out of your currently known spell effects for a fee, and it lets you modify its properties to make the spell to your exact specifications. You suck at Alteration? Make a shorter Levitate spell to get yourself high. Too good at Destruction? Check that fireball range up to 100 to turn that fireball into a goddamn JDAM. 
It's pretty awesome stuff, and it makes the number of spells in the game practically endless. Go nuts with it. The game is begging you to do it. But regardless, cast the newly crafted spell, and if the spell was successful, immediately open your inventory and put the boots on, as time doesn't pass when you're in menus. And our spell will block the blinding effect, which only gets checked once when you put the boots on, and after that, you're set. You can now move almost three times as fast, and this helps shave off a lot of travel time. Only if you want it though, of course. If you don't want it, it's perfectly fine as well. More time to ponder and ruminate on quama eggs and salt rice while on those long journeys. Also, side note, this won't work well for Altmer characters, who have a 50 points weakness to Magicka, making the blinding effect extra powerful to them. I don't recommend it. But, back to the game. And while you're still in Sedanine, you'll also talk to some of the locals, and you'll get introduced to Morrowind's NPC and dialogue systems. Unlike later games, Morrowind has very limited voice lines, as NPCs will usually only blurt out a quick line when you approach them, usually saying something like, Don't piss me off, you dirty, broke, disgusting, swaggerless, mediocre outlander. They're just extremely racist. But when you talk to them properly, it'll open up a dialogue box where you can select topics from the sidebar to ask them about, or try to persuade them if you so desire. NPCs have a decent amount of things to say, and by asking them about the topics you have available, you can unlock more topics to talk about, so get ready to do a bit of reading, as 99% of the dialogue in this game comes through text only. And despite the unvoiced dialogue, which does hurt the game immersion a bit, as we can't hear that beautiful Wes Johnson voice on every NPC. The expanded NPC dialogue makes up for it extremely well. NPCs have way more to say, and talking to them is a great way to learn more about the world and culture of Morrowind, as well as getting extremely important information and directions for nearby services and important NPCs. It's deeper, more robust dialogue at the expense of fully voiced dialogue, even though a lot of the dialogue is copied across multiple NPCs, and they all say the exact same thing through their generic responses to the more generic topics. But overall, it works really well, and you'll get used to it really quickly. All NPCs except special story-related ones also have a reputation score with you, which ranges from 0 to 100, and can be raised by doing favors or quests for them if they have any available, or through persuasion tactics like admiring, taunting, intimidating, or bribing them. But be careful. If your personality numbers are trash, trying anything but a bribe is a seemingly great way to get an NPC to instantly hate you, as your l Riz will quickly crater their reputation with you to zero, and the NPC you're talking to will want to end up killing you over your shitty compliments. Now, I usually don't invest into personality skills in Elder Scrolls games, but luckily for me, whenever an NPC needed persuading, I found that endlessly bribing them 10 septums usually ended up getting them to come around on me. Money talks in Vardenfell, and even the nomadic hunter-gatherer Ashlander tribes love getting some coin, so much so that it makes them stop being ruthlessly xenophobic to our NY ass. Money can solve anything, even racism. It's probably the Elder Scrolls' best implementation of reputation and personality systems, as it makes each NPC have a unique standing with the player. Although it does get a bit cheesy when you convince a neurotically stubborn Telvanni wizard lord to become your best buddy by sliding them a tenor over and over again. But then again, it's probably not too far off from real life. The only issue I have with the NPCs is just how static they are, as they'll either just mill around town aimlessly, or if they're a merchant or important NPC, they'll pretty much stay nailed to the floor in one place at all times. The merchants are addicted to their jobs here, working all day, every day, morndas to sundas, without ever moving to eat, sleep, or piss. It's definitely not great for immersion, but it's really great for gameplay, as you never have to rest and wait until a store opens again like it does in Skyrim, and it keeps shopping as quick as possible. And while we're talking about merchants, I'll explain some of their quirks. At first, it may look like merchants have pretty limited items and inventories, but I'm pretty sure most, if not all merchants will restock their inventories immediately after you make a purchase. You'll have to buy the potions, complete the sale, reopen the barter window, buy the potions again, close the barter window, rinse and repeat until you have the amount you want. It's definitely tedious, but a small price to pay for infinite merchant inventories. This isn't the case for the merchant's gold, however, as their gold will reset after a single day. So when selling off bulk items, you'll have to wait a full day in order to sell some more, as merchants will outright refuse a sale if they can't afford it, and lots of Vardenfell merchants have some pretty low gold reserves. So even if you find an enchanted and expensive item in a dungeon or somewhere similar, you may not be able to sell the item even if you wanted to. But the DLC vendors have much more gold to work with in Mournhold, which you can reach pretty early on. But, forget all of that, and let me tell you another pepperoni secret. You see, in Caldera, there's an unassuming building called Gorak Manor. Inside the manor are a couple of shirtless orcs chilling, loafing around, smoking moon sugar dabs or something. Well, we don't really care about them, as we're here to see Creeper, a non-hostile scamp. Creeper here is actually a merchant, and has 5,000 gold to trade with. And not only that, he also pays full price for items. So I was able to make several thousand septums selling him six house amulets at 2,000 gold a pop, 
is pretty nuts. And you'll be needing that gold for all your spells, potions, repairs, bribes, and most importantly, skill training, as it's the fastest and best way to level up your skills without hours of grinding. And training can cost a few hundred gold per level. So consider trading with Decrepa for some efficient money. But okay, with that out of the way, we can now move on to Marwin's most contentious aspect. It's combat which absolutely takes a bit of time to get familiar with, especially if you're coming off Oblivion or Skyrim, as those games have combat that guarantees a hit with each swing. Marwin's combat is all based on its RPG mechanics and its dice rolls. Combat usually goes something like this. Two enemies see each other, they run up right into each other's faces, and take turns whacking each other and casting spells until one falls over dead. And it's pretty crusty to watch unfold as a spectator. It looks like two action figures rubbing up against each other. But despite the clunky look, Marwin's combat can get pretty tense and powerful, and the more time you put into it, the more you get out of it. And as your skills improve, so does the combat's pace and feel, and it just gets better as it goes on. And there is way more to Marwin's combat than just mashing left mouse button on an enemy endlessly. For melee, you can hold left mouse for a power attack, and you can press W or S with your clicks to perform a thrust attack, or A and D to perform a slash attack. And if you're not moving, you'll default to an overhead shop attack, and each weapon will have different damage ranges based on the attack type. Blunt weapons suck when thrusting, spears suck when chopping or slashing, and so on. Mouse over your weapon to see its damage ranges for each attack type. And if you go the melee route, use the weapon type you chose as a major skill, as trying to use melee weapons you aren't skilled in is a great way to make you hate this game, as your character will be physically incapable of even grazing that chunky rat that's nibbling your toes off, and you'll be hearing that goddamn whooshing miss sound effect echo in your mind endlessly. You'll still miss a lot of attacks even with the weapons you're skilled with when you start out, which can be pretty damn annoying, I'll admit. But you'll still land your attacks and strikes somewhat consistently, and as you level your skills, your attacks start landing more and more consistently, and it's super satisfying to see your character become more accurate and deadly, and you truly do feel improved and stronger as you play the game more. Also, your fatigue, your little bar of green juice, is much more important in combat than say in Skyrim, where fatigue is only used for sprinting and power attacks. Fatigue ties directly into your hit chance, and the lower your fatigue, the less likely you are to land hits. So make sure you have a good amount of fatigue or use restore fatigue potions before entering a scrap. Fatigue is also important for mages too, as spell casting success chance is influenced by your fatigue as well, and you will be much less likely to successfully cast a spell if your fatigue is low. Mages only have to worry about this cast chance for combat, as once spells are cast, they will hit or work without fail, and outside of that, it's your standard mage gameplay. You know, chance to cast a spell, you can only use spells if you have enough magicka, the works. Fatigue only has one major problem, however, as running will drain it. And since your walking speed is that of Russian babushka in negative 10 degree weather, my fatigue was almost always drained from just walking around. Yeah, get the boots. But if enemies aren't nearby, you can rest an hour to instantly fill it back up. And being able to rest and heal outside of settlements is a great feature of this game, as it lets you restore your health, magicka, and stamina completely free, and it really keeps the game's pace consistent. Even if your character is turning into a statue for hours on end staring at an empty field, begging to get jumped by random critters or dark brotherhood assassins as they wait around for their gaping wounds to close back up. And while you're looking for a place to rest, you may happen to open up your inventory menu with right click, which may be one of the greatest menu UIs ever crafted. Marwin's menu has everything you'd ever need. A map of Vardenfell that also toggles to a detailed local map, your character's inventory, stats and skills, and spells. All on one screen and the windows are customizable to be in whatever layout you want. Just drag and move to resize them like you would for a window on your desktop. This menu provides all the information you'd ever need at a glance, and it's fucking sweet. The only thing that it's lacking is your quest journal, which is a separate menu that looks like an actual journal that you flip through the pages for for quest info, along with a quest list. And this journal is going to be your new best friend, because as I alluded to earlier, Marwin is completely devoid of quest markers, and you have to rely on your own wits and verbal instructions the NPCs give you on where to find people and places. On paper, this sounds like a ridiculously dog shit idea, and would lead to just hours of confused meandering and the player getting hopelessly lost. But in execution, it's genius. The game is forcing you to respect its world and actually think about how to get around to your destination, instead of you just mindlessly following the floating marker, like a cat chasing a laser pointer. This forces Vardenfell's layout and design to be clear and well thought out, and the directions given to you almost always felt helpful and accurate. And on very few occasions, I got truly lost and had a call in support to help me progress. Which, quick note, there is absolutely no shame in using the UESP to get a quick point in the right direction, or how to progress an obtuse quest step. Their articles are extremely informative and concise, and that site has probably saved me several hours of faffing about trying to find where I can buy a certain spell, or where a certain cave or dungeon is, or to who to talk to to progress a quest step that didn't give me clear directions. 
Morrowind is all about speeding up processes. But outside of these moments of confusion, getting around Vardenfell is a very engaging experience. We aren't just here to visit and clobber a few fantasy beasts on a pointed tour. To succeed in Morrowind, you gotta get deep into this shit and really immerse yourself in its world and geography. And you'll have to be talking to the locals to get information and advice on how to proceed or find something important. You'll have to memorize where each town and city are and get a feel for each major area of the map. And it's a whole puzzle and gameplay experience unto itself just figuring out the most efficient ways to get to your destinations. You'll be mapping out the route in your head and weighing your options as to which is the fastest route. And it really helps you to get immersed into the world, which is greatly helped by Varnenfell's extremely unique fantastical setting, characters, creatures, and lore. Morrowind really captures that early Elder Scrolls high fantasy feel. Compared to the more down-to-earth European-influenced rolling hills of Cyrodiil and the Viking-styled mountainous region of Skyrim, Morrowind's world is often described as alien, because it's simply the best word you can use to describe it. The game feels like it takes place on a different planet compared to other games in the series, full of giant mushrooms, jagged landscapes, odd folks and architecture, and the imposing as hell red mountain in its surrounding ghost gate, which towers over the entire map and constantly reminds you of the ungodly threat living underneath it. And it's also chock full of some weird ass creatures that you'll be running into every 30 seconds while traveling on the overworld. Like the Nyx Hounds, oversized bugs the size of wolves, the Aelids, two legged alligator looking things, the Guars, the reptilian creatures the Dumber use as pack mules and herd animals over traditional horses and oxen, the Cataguay, aggressive weird two legged dinosaur looking bastards, and most infamously, the Cliff Racers, flying lizards that have been tormenting Morrowind players since 2002. They aren't too bad on paper. They're fairly weak, and they don't hit very hard, but they have several flaws that add up to create the ultimate shitfecta of an Elder Scrolls enemy. They're fairly agile, making them harder to hit than other overworld beast enemies, and their aggro range is huge, so if you see one, they likely saw you as well, which will force you into an encounter, and they make these annoying ass noises and can often gang up on you, forming a skyline to beat your ass, and they're all over the damn place, and spawn in areas that don't feature cliffs at all, and worst of all, Thanks to this game's geriatric engine, cliff racers will often get stuck above you, which will force you to move around so it can jitter its way down to you so you can have the privilege of slaughtering it. That is, if it hasn't gotten caught on tree or cliff geometry. Once you're halfway powerful, these guys are an absolute joke to fight. But just how many there are on Vardenfell, and how long it can take just to get one in the right spot to kill it, makes them the most notorious enemy in the game. And their reputation was so bad, in the Dawnguard DLC, they wrote into the lore that Jib had exterminated every cliff racer off the face of Vardenfell, and was made a saint for his efforts. You know it's a bad enemy when the devs write a genocide of them into the lore. But anyway, also while you're exploring, you'll be able to hear the great soundtrack composed by the legendary Jeremy Soule. His music is inseparable from the Elder Scrolls series at this point, and for good reason. This shit is gas. But in this case, Morrowind can be a bit too much of a good thing as the game's soundtrack is only 40-something minutes long, so you'll be hearing the same tracks over and over again. And when you enter combat, the music will switch to a battle track, and when combat's over, it'll restart the music immediately, which can get a bit repetitive over time. But I didn't mind too much, so most of the music is very good. But it really makes you appreciate the later soundtracks and sound designs of the later games. There's just way more variety. Along with these crazy enemies and settlements are the dumber people themselves, which are presented in a high-concept fantasy, yet totally realistic way. The towns and cities all have very different looks and feels based on their house culture. Hualu towns like Balmora have a mix of imperial and more modern style Dunmer architecture, and Radorn towns like Aldrun contain their signature shell style architecture, built from or to look like the bodies of massive slain bugs. And the Telvanni towns are built out of massive, magically grown mushroom towers and homes. The Dunmer people themselves have a highly realistic disposition. They're grumpy, untrusting, xenophobic pricks. What now, Lander? Why do you disturb me? much like the real world. And you, the player, are an outlander, someone born outside of Vardenfell. And we don't take too kindly to Enwa in these parts. But past this initial hostility, the cultures and people feel incredibly genuine. The Dumber are very proud and conservative people, and aren't exactly happy to be subjects of a foreign, Enwa-ran empire that worship nine bitch-ass divines, instead of the based Alm Sivi. And you can learn to understand their beliefs and culture through their deep lore and expansive religious beliefs. And it's super cool to be able to trace the history of the land and the Dumber people all the way back to their original migration from the now Somerset Islands, led by their prophet Veloth. But I'll get more into the lore in the main quest section of this video. But this attention to detail and cohesive designs for each of the unique cultures really make Vardenfell feel that much more real. 
It's great stuff. And I'm a sucker for media with deep lore that almost reads like a history textbook. And Morrowind is the perfect game for me with its deep historical and religious lore that takes aspects of real life cultures and religions to create such an engrossing setting that's alien, yet wholly believable and sincere. There are also multiple factions available to join and complete quest lines for. And you got your staples of a fighters, mage, and thieves guild, the Imperial Legion, the Imperial Cult, the Tribunal Temple, the Morak Tong, and you can even join vampire clans for some shorter quest lines. And on top of all of this, you can choose to join one of the three Grey Houses of Ardenfell. You can join the mercantile and subterfuge focused Halalu Democrats, the honor bound and warrior lifestyle focused Radoran Conservatives, or the slave loving wizard society of the Telvanni Libertarians. And through their quest lines, you can build up your own stronghold player home throughout their expansive quest lines. Although the Grey Houses are the only mutually exclusive factions, you will need to create several characters to get the most out of each faction, as progression through the factions is based not only on completing quests, but you also must pass the required skill and attribute thresholds relevant to the faction specializations to rise up the faction ranks to unlock even more quests and services from them. For example, if you want to rank all the way up in the Fighters Guild, you'll need to get one martial skill such as Long Blade to 90, and then two other skills at 35 or above, such as Armorer or another strength-derived skill. It makes the factions seem more like realistic, meritocratic factions, as you have to have the skills to back up your work. It's not like Skyrim where you can become the Archmage of the College of Winterhold without ever casting an offensive spell, and it just reinforces Morrowind's RPG design. I will not be going into detail about all the factions in this video, as we'd be here literally all day, but the factions are expansive and genuinely intriguing, and they have some really unique quest design, like the Tribunal Temple's first quest, which will have you traveling all over Vardenfell following the Pilgrim's Path to seven holy sites, following in Vivik's footsteps. It's a lot of work, but it feels like a true test of faith. And that's just one quest for one faction out of 11 potential factions per character. They'll keep you busy. And with that, you should have most of what you need to know before truly striking out into Morrowind proper. The last major thing to note is that the world of Morrowind is a fully persistent and open world, with preset item and enemy placements that remain the same throughout the entire game, as well as all towns and cities being open and load free. There ain't no level scaling and randomized loot tables here. Only overworld enemies have level scaling to them. And if you know where to go, you can get your hands on some god items pretty early on. The biggest example of this are the unique items in Daedric gear. You cannot craft a set of Daedric armor. Smithing isn't even a thing in this game. And the only way to acquire a set is to find the pieces out in the world. And there is only enough for two full sets. And to get both, you'd have to kill an essential main quest NPC to get one of the Kyrises. And no NPC in this game is unkillable, not even Vivek. And when you kill an essential NPC to the main quest, a pop-up will appear that says the prophecy has been severed, forcing you to reload a save. But you can work around even this, and there's a whole back road and alternate way to complete the main quest. It's super interesting stuff. Speaking of armor, there's a lot of opportunity to mix and match and combine with clothes and robes to get some serious drip. There are armor slots for your helmet, cuirass, greaves, boots, left and right pauldrons and gauntlets. And you can wear clothes such as a shirt, pants, and a skirt underneath your armor, and robes over them. And you can wear two rings and an amulet on top of that too. Now my character ain't a baby, but goddamn is he throwing a fit. I was rocking a sweet robe over my armor for the entire game. And these robes and clothing items can come with enchantments, both passive and active, giving you the ability to be chained out the ass with up to 18 items worn at a time, which can mean 18 extra enchantments and spells for your character. Marwin characters really got that shit on. But despite the exploitability of this system, it's really awesome for naturally encouraging exploration and rewarding players by taking time to do said exploring. Just one example, when I was on my way to Tell Fear for the main quest, I decided to clear out a cave I came across, just on a whim. And when I fought the wizard lady at the end of the cave, she dropped the legendary blade Chrysomir, which I used for pretty much the rest of the game until late in the Tribunal DLC. And it's a blast to just comb through these dungeons to see what you can find. Anything from a legendary sword to a pendant that gives you a free levitation spell. It's great and it's my favorite implementation of the loot system in the Elder Scrolls series. It really gives that sense of discovery the later games kind of lack. Just take a look at this tomb for example. It may seem unassuming, but you can find a long winding staircase into a massive burial tomb in a maze, which then leads into this really cool hidden chamber complete with a Nordic ship burial and everything. But this isn't even the end of it. There's a secret cave in here that we have to levitate up to, and in it, we can find an extremely rare Daedric Helm and a Daedric Warhammer. It's super sweet, and no modern Elder Scrolls game would even think of trying to do this. But before we get to the main quest, there's one last thing I need to tell you about. That's right, now we can talk about alchemy. Alchemy in Morrowind is the most busted shit in the entire series. Potions and their effects stack in this game, and the most powerful potion you can make is the Fortify Intelligence Potion. Once you have a couple bands of septums, and have stolen the set of Master Alchemy tools from up in a tower in the Caldera Mages Guild that they have left completely unguarded, 
I mean, shit's practically begging to get stolen. You can then head on over to Wolverine Hall via a Mage's Guild Guide, and go to the Imperial Shrine there, and trade with Aonius Autrius. Aonius is my dog, cause he sells ash yams and blow, which combine to make Fortify Intelligence Potions. So buy up a shipping crate's worth of these ingredients, and then use them to make Fortify Intelligence Potions. And once they're made, drink them all, and then rebuy the ingredients, and then rinse and repeat this process until you become more intelligent than all the nine divines combined by consuming nothing but yams and cave sponge. And since alchemy is governed by intelligence, your potions will start getting exponentially more powerful as you further ascend to tool music video tier intelligent. Maybe Sothasil got so smart by accidentally eating a dinner of ash yams with a side of bloat one time. Anyway, once you have an intelligence that's in the tens of thousands, the game is just bent over at this point, waiting for you to break it. So I went ahead and using some cliff racer plumes, I made a few levitation spells that make me move this fast. And this potion's effect will last for 2000 seconds, which is over 30 minutes of real time. So with just this one potion, I'm able to fly laps around the map and turn myself into a human MQ-9 Reaper drone. These god potions make the game completely trivial, but it's just so much fun to experiment and make god potions with pretty much any effect you want. And it lets you achieve chim completely without mods or hacks. It's just so good. It's so good that Bethesda had to nuke alchemy into the dirt from then on. It was simply too powerful. But with that, we can move on and take a look at Morrowind's main quest. And the story on offer here is some of Bethesda's finest work. But first, some background about the world of Morrowind. Morrowind doesn't actually take place in all of Morrowind, rather on the central island of Vardenfell. Morrowind is the home of the Dunmer, also known as the Dark Elves, a race of dark-skinned, red-eyed elves who came to Morrowind following their prophet Velov. But the Dunmer weren't always the Dunmer, and originally, they were known as the Chimer, yellow-skinned elves that were very similar to their Altmer relatives, but had schism with them over their worship of the three good Daedra, Azura, Boethia, and Mafala. So, led by their prophet Veloth, had traveled from the Somerset Isles to Resdane, aka Morrowind, and this Velothi migration was a whole spirit journey unto itself. It even created the race of orcs, when the elven god Trinimac tried to stop their migration, only to get stabbed in the back by Mafala, and then according to legend, was devoured and shit out into oblivion, and out of this poop pile, he emerged as Malakath, and all of his elven followers were morphed into the Orsimer, or as we know him as the Orcs. Some pretty crazy shit, not gonna lie. But when they arrived, they weren't alone, as the Dwemer, aka the Dwarves, were already living there. The Dwemer being the enigmatic, highly technologically advanced elves who built incredible machines and automatons, and despite often being called Dwarves, they weren't actually short and squat like a typical dwarf. That's just the races of men trolling them. The only thing they have in common with real short dwarves is that they live underground. But the Dwemer and Chimer relations were fairly icy at best, until Dwemer King Dumak and Lord Hortator Indoril Nerevar of the Chimer had joined forces to drive the Nord occupiers out of Morrowind, and created the first Dwemer Chimer Council, with Nerevar and Dumak's friendship being the backbone of this alliance. However, Things were not all sweet rolls and salt rice for long between the two races, as Dumak's top guy, Chief Tunnel Architect Kagranak, had discovered the heart of Lorcan beneath Red Mountain. This artifact being the living heart of the trickster god Lorcan, a mysterious god who may have been responsible for the creation of Mundus and Tamriel, who had convinced the gods to use their divine power to create the world, and unbeknownst to them, the gods would never be able to reclaim the power they expended in creating the world. One legend has it that when the gods found out that their power had been permanently diminished in Tamriel's creation, the gods convened, decided to punish Lorcan for his actions, and ripped his still beating heart out of his body and threw it at Tamriel. And the heart created Red Mountain where it landed. But this is just one of the many in-universe creation myths, but it seems most in line with this game's story, and it's my personal favorite. Regardless, Kagranak planned to use the heart to create and power the Numidium, essentially a massive Dwemer mech that was to be a god of their own creation. An automaton so large and powerful, just turning it on causes the fabric of time and space to be warped and overwritten. Uh, see the end of Daggerfall's story for details. This would be done through the usage of three artifacts on the heart. The hammer Sunder, the sword Keening, and the gauntlet Wraithguard, which would be used on the heart to produce divine power. The Dwemer were not only somehow atheistic in a world where gods are very present and real, they also thought themselves superior to the gods, and were ops with them by choice. They wanted to build the Numidium as not only a monument to their ingenuity, but a massive middle finger to the gods themselves. And this whole brass god thing probably wouldn't go over well with the trad, extremely religious-based society of the Chimer. And when Indoral Nerevar's close friend Vorin Dagoth had found out about this dwarven heresy to the gods, things quickly went south between these two Mer groups, and the War of the First Council broke out. And this war culminated in the Battle of Red Mountain where Kagranak uses tools to strike the heart, but doing so caused all of the Dwemer to disappear off the face of Tamriel. 
never to be seen again by anyone, not even the gods. But with the Dwemer gone, the war was over. But here's where things start getting a bit hazy. Sometime after the battle, Nerevar had told Vorin Dega to watch over the tools while he got counsel from Azura on what to do next. From here, the temple claims that when Nerevar returned to Dagoth, he had gone mad from the influence of the heart and the tools, and refused to give them up, forcing a battle between Nerevar and Dagoth, which ended up killing both, leaving the tribunal with the tools, eventually gaining their divine power. On the flip side, the Ashlanders believe that the tribunal had rather conspired to kill Nerevar, whether that be poisoning him, or a brutal face-skinning, feet-chopping, spear-through-the-chest violent assassination. But whatever they did, they had off Nerevar and subdued Dagoth, and used the tools to gain divine powers, and cemented themselves as the new gods of Morrowind. Known as the Tribunal of Nerevar's wife Almalexia, the scientist mage Sothasil, and Fruity Vivek. Once the Tribunal became gods, legend claims that Azura had appeared before them, and berated them for this divine transgression, cursing the Chimer with their fiery red eyes and dark skin, turning them into the dumber we know today. But despite the curse, the Tribunal were able to successfully reassure their people that this change was a blessing, and not a curse. And they established their power through the Tribunal Temple, and integrated the Chimeri reverence of Boethia, Azura, and Mephala onto themselves, and have since served as the gods and rulers of a new Morrowind. However, despite destroying his house and his name, they failed to fully destroy Vorin Dagoth, who is now known as Dagoth-Ur, as he had managed to gain a connection to the heart, and by extension, became an immoral, mad, and endlessly dreaming demigod. Which is where we catch up to Morrowind's start. We are an unknown prisoner, sent by the Emperor himself to Vardenfell for an unknown purpose. And that's where we wake up. We first see a vague dream about prophecy, and a role we may have to play. And then we wake up to Jib's beautiful mug. We are then escorted off the ship and into the Seda Neen Census and Excise Office, where we do the previously mentioned character and class creation, and get our tutorials out of the way. Once processed, we're given an encoded package we have to deliver to Caius Casades, a Blades agent currently shacked up in Balmora. The Blades are sort of the Imperial CIA, intelligence officers and spies who work to carry out the Emperor's will. We can hitch a ride to Balmora on the Silt Strider, and we can find Caius's house at the northeast corner of Balmora. Once inside, we find a shirtless, yet extremely jacked old man living in a moon sugar flop house. Sorry, didn't mean to break into the local tweaker's trap house. But don't worry, you're in the right place. Caius's cover is a skooma addict, pretty much a Tamrielic liquid ketamine cocaine walk that's made from moon sugar, a psychoactive drug from elsewhere, the land of the cat people. But unfortunately for Caius, he got a little too deep into his cover, and he ended up getting addicted to the stuff. But at least skooma doesn't kill your gains, it seems. Let's pack We deliver the package to Caius, who inducts us into the Blades, and he recommends that we do some exploration and side questing before continuing the main quest. Marwan's main quest really gels well with its open world design, and the early game quests are very low priority narratively, and the game really wants you to go out there and get acclimated with the world before plunging deeper into the story. And it's really nice to be able to take our time and not have our immersion broken by faffing about and doing side quests, while the main quest is waiting for us to give it attention again. But, we can also ignore all this advice and just click orders again to get our first real assignment. Caius tasks us to do some work for his informants, to gather information on the mysterious Sixth House, and the prophecy of the Nerevarine. We first talk to Hasfat Anabalus in the Fighters Guild, who asks us to get a puzzle box from the nearby Dwemer Ruin. It's the game's first real combat skill check, as you have to kill the bridge man who summons a skeleton to proceed to the ruin, and he's this game's noob killer. He's the snow troll, if you will, and the rest of the dungeon gets you familiar with dungeon layouts and how to look for items. We can find the puzzle box fairly close to the entrance, and we head back to exchange it for Hasfat's notes. The next quest is pretty similar, having to delve into a burial tomb to get a skull for the orc mage Sharn Gra Muzgob. <laughs> she will give you an enchanted sword to hit the ghost with, as ghosts and Daedra are immune to non-enchanted, non-glass, and non-Daedric weapons, teaching the player about enemy types and advantages. Same thing here, clear the dungeon, get the skull, and run it on back for more information we can give to Caius. Next, Caius asks us to head on over to the largest city in the game, Vivek, and talk to three informants about the Nerevarine and the Six House cults. Vivek is an interesting beast as a city, as it feels truly large and imposing, mostly thanks to the slow walking speed and the large canton building designs. And it'll take you a long time to find all the informants on your first trip here, as you'll have to act like a real tourist, asking locals where we can find our informants, and learning where all the cantons are located. It's full-on detective work here, and I like it a lot. We can find one informant, the Argonian Hulia, being pressed by racist Dunmer thugs in the foreign quarter. The Dunmer are viciously racist against the beast races of Tamriel, and Argonians and Khajiit are often enslaved by the Dunmer, with them often launching invasions and incursions into Black Marsh and elsewhere to capture more slaves. We can either kill the racists, or Ten Sept and bribe them to fuck off, 
and we can escort Julia to Joe Basha's rare books to get his info. Next up is the Khajiit smuggler Adhiranir, who is hiding from an Imperial taxman in the St. Olm sewers. We throw the taxman off her trail, and she tells us that other smugglers are getting a lot of work from a new client, and are moving unknown goods for the sixth house. Finally, we have to talk to Mira Milo in the temple library, and she tells us about the Nerevarian prophecies and tells us to get a book called The Progress of Truth for Caius, a book written by the dissident priest of the Tribunal Temple that outlines the inconsistencies in temple doctrine and what actually happened surrounding the creation of the Tribunal. We can buy the book from that kitty Jobasha and return to Caius to complete the quest. Next up, Caius tells us to make contact with an Ashlander in Aldra named Hasor Zane Zubani in order to establish an informant amongst the Ashlander tribes who are tribes of nomadic Dunmer who live the trad tribal of Alothi life and reject the tribunal temple and still practice their Daedra and ancestor worship. We can befriend Hasur if we give him a thoughtful gift, as his Ashland are custom to give gifts to make friends. Hasur wants a book of poetry, which we can buy from the nearby bookseller, who will recommend books for us to buy Hasur. What a classy guy. After we give him the book, Hasur will give us his notes on the Ashlanders and the Nervarine cult, and we return to Caius. When we return, Caius will drop a truth bomb on us, and he finally reveals why we're looking so deeply into these local rumors and legends. It turns out that Emperor Uriel Septim himself has reason to believe that we may fit the Nerevarim prophecies, and he has sent us to Vardenfeld to see if there's any legitimacy to that. To figure out if we could truly be the Nerevarim, we need to head to the northern end of the island and make contact with the Urshalaku Ashlander tribe, and there we can learn about the prophecies and see if we are indeed in Doral Nerevar come back to life. It's a long trek up to the Urshalaku camp every time, so consider dropping a mark recall point there. So once you cut your way through a horde of rats and cliff racers and arrive at the camp, you have to first befriend a tribe member. The best way to do this is by gifting trauma roots to the Ashlanders who ask for it, as they're pretty easy to find nearby. Or you can just do the classic 10 set and bribe as always. And once we're chums, we can tell the tribe member that we believe we may be the Nerevarine. They'll point us to speak with a Ghulakan, who will fleece us for 200 septums, and will then tell us to speak with their Ashkan Sulmatul for more info. Old Sul here isn't really buying our story, but he sees we have some conviction at least, so he tasks us with a trial to obtain his father's bow from their nearby burial grounds, so we head on over to find it. The Urshalaku tomb is the first real big boy dungeon of the main quest, and it's a really great start. It's a fairly large cave with a really cool layout, and I really like the central chamber where you have to climb up the central spire to access each area of the dungeon. And there's a ton of sweet loot to grab off the mummies in here. I hope the Urshalaku don't mind a bit of grave looting. And I even found a sweet glass longsword called Magebane in here by levitating to unreachable areas to look for loot. Just watch out for the skeletal archers though. They can shoot you with paralyzing arrows that will lock you in place, refresh on every hit, and you can do nothing but just watch in terror as your health whittles down to zero. And you gotta crust these bastards out. So I hit around corners to bait them to come closer to me, and then I wailed on them with power attacks to stunlock them to win. Cheese or be cheese, bonehead. But once we reach the end of the cave, and take out the powerful ghost who is holding onto the bow, we can run it back to Sul Matul, who will make us clan friend, and lets us speak with their wise woman, Nabani Mesa. We talk to her to learn more about the Nerevarine prophecies and how we may fit into it all. She tells us that in order for us to become the Nerevarine, we must fulfill seven trials that herald the return of Nerevar. And these trials are... 1. Born on a certain day to uncertain parents, which we fulfill as an unknown Elder Scrolls prisoner, who never have parents ever. 2. Is immune to all diseases and aging, which we are definitely currently vulnerable to. 3. Has found the Cave of the Incarnate and has received the Moon and Star after communing with Azura which we definitely haven't done. Number four, we'll unite all the great houses as Hortator, which we have not done. Number five, we are recognized by all four Ashlander tribes as the Nerevarine, which we definitely also haven't done. Number six, we have eaten the sin of the tribe unmourned, which may refer to both House Dagoth and the Dwemer, and use Kagranak's tools to undo their actions, which we currently aren't even aware of. And number seven, his mercy frees the cursed false gods, which means that we will destroy the heart of Lorcan and end the power of the Tribunal, which we also have not done. After learning about the Nerevarine prophecies, we can ask Nabani if we pass the test as Nerevarine, to which she says, Fuck no, baby! But that's no reason to worry, as we still may be able to become the Nerevarine, if we can pass the tests. So Nabani then tells us to get a copy of The Lost Prophecies, a book that was written by the dissident priests of the temple, which may help us understand the more esoteric parts of the Nerevarine prophecy better. We return to Caius with this info, who says that he will try to get in contact with Mira Milo about getting a copy of the Lost Prophecies. But in the meantime, he's got a tough job for us. It appears that the Imperial Legion had found a 6th house base near Narmak, and the patrol had been either wiped out or infected with a nasty case of Corpus, 
aka the Blight, which is a divine leprosy-like disease created by Dagoth Ur that he spreads via the giant ash storms generated by having his ash vampire smoke <laughs> Grazeland weed all day beneath Red Mountain. Corpus mutates those it infects into zombie-like mutants and gives Dagoth Ur control over them. So we report to Fort Buckmoth to learn a bit more info, and then head to Narmak to look for their base, Ilunibi Cave. We can talk to the Narmakian locals for info, and using my highly persuasive $10 bribe strategy, we learn its location and head inside. And this is our first real fight against the forces of Dagoth Ur and his minions, which include the underwear-clad dreamers, who are local Dunmer who have been mind-dominated by Dagoth Ur through their dreams. There's also the magic-using Ash Slaves, and the local leader, Dagoth Gares, an Ash Ghoul and Preacher of Dagoth Ur. The designs for the Ash Monsters are super dope, as there's a progression of their deformities as they increase in power. They start as a dreamer, and then their face caves in, leaving only a hole where their eyes and nose used to be. And when they power up to the level of Dagoth Gares, they grow a trunk-like proboscis out of their face hole, turning into literal dickheads before finally transforming into the Ascended Sleeper, a hulking creature with a squid-like face of tentacles and holes. It's pretty nasty shit, but it's really awesome and eldritch looking, and it really conveys how unnatural and deformed the defined powers of Dagoth Ur are. And Bethesda always cooks when it comes to eldritch Lovecraftian designs like this. But anyway, Gare speaks to us, addressing us as the Nerevarine, so I like our odds of being Nerevar reborn even better now. He tells us that the Sixth House is returning in full force, and that this place is just one quiet outpost in a massive operation. And he tells us that Dagoth Ur wants to speak with us to reconcile, and asks us to go to Red Mountain to submit if we want to help Dagoth Ur. But in reality, you cannot join the Sixth House in any capacity in base Marwind. You are code-bound ops with the Sixth House no matter what. So tough luck for anyone who wanted to join up with their daddy Dagoth Ur. And once we're done with speaking with Gares, we have to cut his worm-faced ass down. And once you kill him, Gares will curse you with corpus disease. Damn, caught the divine syphilis. We return to Caius to report our killing of Gares, but now we have to deal with this nasty Corporus infection. And while you have Corporus, the NPCs will be disgusted at the sight of you, and will yell at you to go away when you speak to them. And just speaking to the NPCs will drop their reputation with you, so we have to cure this shit ASAP. Caius tells us that our best bet for a cure is to seek help from the Telvanni wizard lord Diveth Fear in his remote tower near Sadrith Mora, and he gives us a Dwemer mechanism as a peace offering to him. Fear is an incredibly interesting character, being over 4,000 years old, and he was even born as a Chimer. That's how damn old he is. He's also a certified freak, and lives with his four daughter clone wives. Bro is the ho tator of House Goonvani. The reason why we're here is that he's researching Corpus and its effects, as the disease is divine in nature, and has piqued his interest, and he maintains a Corpusarium beneath his tower. We go to tell Fear by taking the Mage's Guild Uber service to Sadrith Mora, and then water walking across the scattered islands to reach his tower. And once inside, we float on up to find Fear, and give him the mechanism to just tickle him pink. We tell him about our Nervarine plight and our Corpus infection, and he says that he has a potion that should cure Corpus, but has killed all his previous test subjects. <laughs> Real reassuring, bro. He tells us that he'll give us the potion in exchange for a pair of Dwemer boots from Yagram Bagarn down in the Corpusarium. So we head on down and find Yagram after a short walkthrough, being sure not to hurt the shambling Corpus zombies down there. As if you attack them, Divith Fear will get pissed at you and will break the quest. We talk to Yagram, who is another incredibly fascinating character, as he is the last surviving Dwemer in all of Elder Scrolls lore. He claims that he was in a, quote, outer realm during the disappearance of the dwarves, and he missed out on all that being blipped out of existence chicanery during the Battle of Red Mountain, and was pretty shocked to find that the rest of his race had vanished off the face of Tamriel when he had returned. He eventually arrived at Red Mountain in search of his people, where he found nothing but Dagoth Ur's syphilis storms, and contracted Corpus, and now leads a pretty pathetic existence as a deformed Corpus victim living in a dingy cave basement of a 4,000 year old Ancap Coomer. We get the boost from him and return to fear, and drink his concoction. Bottoms up. But amazingly, we didn't die horribly from the potion, and in fact, it seems to have nullified all our corporate symptoms. We still have the disease, but the potion will keep us from suffering any effects from it. This also comes with the additional bonus of eternal life, as corporate has the ability to make its victims immortal. So that's pretty sweet. But with this potion consumed and our corporate effectively gone, that fulfills the third trial of the prophecy, as we no longer can get sick from any in-game disease, outside of one instance that I'll talk about in the later DLCs. As for why the potion didn't kill us, maybe we got lucky, maybe we truly are Nerevar reborn, or maybe we just got some divine intervention. But the truth is uncertain, and these uncertain aspects of the story are really fascinating to think about, and it really lets you question prophecy and come to your own conclusions as to whether we are truly Nerevar incarnate, 
or just a really lucky guy with a Zura on our side. Or maybe we're just that goaded and we became Nerevarine through our own actions. But regardless of the truth, we can return back to Caius, who has some bad news for us. He's being recalled to the Imperial City, as it seems the Emperor may croak any day now, and the following Imperial succession could get pretty messy. This is the same Emperor from Oblivion, mind you, so I guess they had bigger issues in the end than succession. But regardless, Caius has to go, and I'll miss you, my friend. My elderly, jacked, skooma-addicted friend. I'll make sure that your home becomes the greatest flop house to dump items into of all time. But before he goes, he gives us his clothes and his ring, which provides some nice stealth base effects like Chameleon. And then he gives us our final orders to find Mira Milo and to get a copy of the Lost Prophecies. So we're back off to Vivek. We look for Milo in the temple, but she's nowhere to be found. And we can check her office and find a secret note from her, saying that she has been arrested and detained in the Ministry of Truth, the giant floating rock hanging in the sky near Vivek's temple. Also known as Bar Dao, the Ministry of Truth is a meteor that was thrown at Vivek City by the Daedric God of Madness, Shio Gorath, but was stopped in its tracks by Vivek, suspended in time over the city held in place by Vivek's power and the Dumber's faith within him. As if their faith in him waned, Bardao would start moving again at full speed, as Bardao's momentum was never stopped, only suspended. And surely this won't be a problem later and won't crash to Earth and cause a massive catastrophe. Surely. But in the meantime, it has been hollowed out to serve as a prison for the temple, and we gotta bust Milo out of it. We can talk to the door guard, who is secretly on our side, and will let us in and tell us where to find Milo. So I run inside and dodge the guards until I find her cell, and I pass her a divine intervention scroll to get her out. She tells us to meet her at the dissident priest base in Holomion, which we can reach via boat from a sympathetic fisherwoman in Ebonheart. So we teleport out as well, and head to Holomion. Inside we can talk to the leader of the dissident priests, and get a copy of the Lost Prophecies. We can also learn more about the temple from them, and we learn that the temple had built the ghost gate around Red Mountain as a way of containing Dagoth Ur and his nasty minions inside of Red Mountain, and that the tribunal would make semi-regular trips to cull the monsters, subdue Dagoth Ur, and tap the heart to maintain their divine powers. However, over time it seems that the temple has gotten weaker, and Dagoth Ur has gotten stronger, and the temple is no longer able to subdue Dagoth, and the tribunal are now on the defensive against his expanding sixth house. But their biggest contention is that the tribunal doctrine lies about their divine nature, claiming that her divinity was gained through insight, discipline, and wisdom, using this vague bullshit story as a cover for their usage of the tools. And any objection to the temple's story is persecuted heavily by the House and Dora Ordinators, who are essentially the temple cops. But regardless, we take the Lost Prophecies back to Nabani Mesa, where we learn that the Nerevarine will be an Outlander, and we still have three more trials to complete. So we still aren't Nerevarine. To fix this, we gotta find out where the Cave of the Incarnate is, and its location is shrouded in mystery and riddles, and Sulmatul will tell us this riddle, in exchange for another test. This time he wants us to go and clear out the stronghold Kogarun, where we must obtain a corpus weeping, a six house cup, and get the shadow shield artifact to prove we were there. So off we go. It's a tough dungeon, and you'll be taking on the ascended sleepers, ash ghouls, and some tough Daedra, but be sure to grab their six house amulets that they drop. They weigh one pound each and can be sold to Creeper for 2,000 gold a pop. Six house items can get you rich, so stock up and loot whatever you can find. We reach the tunnels underneath the stronghold and come face to face with our first Ash Vampire, the strongest members of the Sixth House outside of the big guy himself. They're these ultra jack dark elves that actually aren't vampires, and are more like sorcerers. They aren't even technically undead. But it's still a tough ass fight, and I barely scrape by with my life after landing some lucky hits. And once he's dead, we can loot the place for the Shadow Shield and some Daedra Gauntlets. Don't miss those. And we can return to Suul Matul with proof of our work. In exchange, he gives us the Riddle of the Cavern of the Incarnate. The eye of the needle lies in the teeth of the wind. The mouth of the cave lies in the skin of the pearl. The dream is the door, and the star is the key. Whatever that fucking means. We can learn more concrete info by asking some other Ashlanders, who will tell us about a valley of the wind, a valley on the northern slopes of Red Mountain, which you can find by looking for two large rock spires. We travel through this valley and up a hill until we reach the Cavern of the Incarnate, which you can only enter during hours of dawn or dusk. Inside the cave, we find a large statue of Azura, and in her hands, we can find the legendary ring of Nerevar, the Moon and Star, which provides a 5-point personality and speechcraft buff. Kind of pathetic for a legendary ring to only make you slightly more charismatic. But I digress. This ring is more of a lore thing anyway. As legend states that the ring gave Endoral Nerevar such W Riz, he was able to unite all the Dunmer, Grey Houses, Ashlander tribes, and Dwemer alike using his ring. And after we get the ring, we can meet the ghosts of previously failed incarnates, who will tell you their stories and give you a bevy of enchanted items to help you. And some are kinda useless, but hey, it's the thought that counts. And it's a really cool moment, 
and it gives more credence and weight to our goal of becoming Nerevarine, as we could easily just end up like one of these L incarnates if we aren't careful. But with that, that's another trial fulfilled, and we return to the Urshalaku camp with our sweet new jewelry. We speak with Sul Matul, who names us Nerevarine of the Urshalaku, and our goal is to get the remaining three tribes to name us Nerevarine, and for the three great houses to name us Hortator. At this point in the story, we have begun declaring ourselves as the Nerevarine, and are now an outlaw to the temple. So be careful around ordinators, as they'll jump your heretical ass if you're on their bad side. So to unite the tribes and houses, I first help the Ahamusa tribe, who need help clearing out a Daedric ruin to the north of temple agents and Sheogorath worshippers, so they can move in and escape the blight storms and corpus beasts invading their lands. It's a pretty busy dungeon, as temple agents are here to kill the Daedra worshippers, and if you tell the temple agents that you're the Nereverine, they'll attack you on sight for such disgusting heresy. And it's a tough dungeon. You'll have to take out some golden saints and bone lorn summoning mages to clear it fully out. But once it's cleared, we can return to the Ahamusa camp and get the wise woman to follow us right back to the dungeon. So you gotta make two round trips for this quest. Once we lead her to the statue of Sheol Gorath, she names us the Ahamusa Nerevarine. Sweet. Two down, two to go. Next, I head to Aldrun to convince House Radorn to name me Hortator. The only Radorn counselor who will give us the time of day is Athen Serethi, who will agree to vouch for us as Hortator if we can rescue his son from Bolvin Venom's manor. To find his son, you gotta find a key and a note on a bench that tells you that he's being held in a hidden room behind the tapestry. And I'm not really a fan of these type of quests, as I don't find it very rewarding to have to go on a pixel hunt for a small low poly key that you don't even know you need to be looking for. And although there are spells like Detect Key available to speed up the scavenger hunt, I'm glad these key hunts were dropped in later games. But regardless, we take the key and Varver with us, as Venom's manor guards try to stop me, and I cut them down, spilling their blood all over the nice manor floors. But the other Venom Manor residents seem unbothered by me slaughtering these guards and freeing their hostage right in front of their faces. So we return Varver to his dad and Athen agrees to vouch for us. Next we have to then speak to all the other Radoran counselors to cement their support. And once we have their support, we can confront their leader, Bolvin Venom, who is the Archmaster of House Radorn, who challenges us to a duel as he won't stand for an unwashed outlander to become Hortator. We travel to the Vivek Arena to fight him, and he's another tough opponent, equipped with ebony armor and a Daedric Dai Katana. So make sure you got some health potions lined up before you fight him. But once he's dead, you can take his sweet loot, and we can return to Athen to be officially named Radorn Hortator. Sweet. Next up is House Lalu, and to become their Hortator, we need to head to the Hlalu Canton and speak with Crash's Curio. Curio is another interesting character, being the author of several in-game books, namely The Lusty Argodian Maid, and The Dance of the Three-Legged Guar. And that Guar's name may or may not be Zhang Zhangchang. The dude is an absolute fruitcake calling you his dumpling, and if you have a good reputation with him, he will offer you his vote in exchange for a kiss. But he didn't like me enough, I guess, so I had to shell out a band of septums for him. Damn. Guess I'm not good enough for Uncle Crashes, huh? He then tells us that we need to find and convince the rest of the Hlalu counselors to vote for us. We can find one counselor, Orvis Dren, at his plantation. When we ask for his vote and tell him our story, he tells us that he has allied with Dagoth Ur to destroy the tribunal and to kick the Enwa Empire out of Marwind, and he attacks us on sight. I defend myself and Orvis Dren turns into Orvis dead, and with him dead, we can use that killing to strong arm Nevena Ulis and Volanda Omani into voting for us, as they were working for Dren. And we can find the last two counselors in the St. Olm's Canton. We can either kill or bribe Ingling Half-Troll to vote for us, and our last counselor is hiding somewhere in the Canton. Hmm, surely he isn't hiding in this conspicuously named Haunted Manor. Well, sure enough, behind a locked door in the manor is Dram Barrow who will vote for us on account that we are clever enough to find him. Thanks, man. But with that, that's all the counselors recruited to our side, so we can return to Crashus and confirm ourselves as Hlalu Hortator. Thanks, Pumpkin. Next is to become Hortator of House Telvani, and we can speak to Arianne and tell Voss to get started with that. Arianne agrees to vote for us, but we need to convince Neloth, Dratha, and Tharana to vote for us as well, which we can do by making them an offer they can't refuse. Many, many $10 bribes. All the Telvani lords don't care about a Hortator, the only thing they want to do is pursue magical power and status. So all we need to do is raise our disposition with each of them, and they will agree when we ask them to. Or, we could just kill them. The final obstacle is Archmagister Gothrin, who cannot be convinced to name us Hortator, as he would just delay the vote indefinitely. So Arianne advises that we just straight up murder him, which is totally normal in Telvanni society, as they believe wholly that might makes right. You can kick down the mushroom door of any Telvanni wizard tower, slaughter the wizard lord and all of his servants, and face zero punishment for your actions. Oh, you killed the leader of our faction? Well, since he died, he clearly didn't deserve to be leader. He was too weak, so it's all good. And that's exactly what I did. But be ready to fight Gothrin, 
On top of him being a powerful wizard, he also has two Dramoral warriors backing him up, so I used the Summon Golden Saint scroll I had picked up for some extra backup, and was able to defeat him with the help of my buddy in a pretty close battle. But with Gothrin out of the way, we can return to Arion to be confirmed as Telvanni Hortator. And with that, that fulfills the fifth trial, now that all the houses recognize us as Hortator. Nice. But we still have to convince the last two Ashlander tribes, so I head to the Arabinism camp to fix that. The Arabinism are a violent and war-loving tribe, who would never choose an Outlander as the Nerevarine. So when we talk to their wise woman, who's probably tired of the Ashkan shit, she recommends that we just outright kill all the tribe leaders, and install a more peaceful member as Ashkan. So I kill the Ashkan and his goons, and I get Wimpy Hanamu here to become the new Ashkan, and I need to motivate him by pimping him out with the enchanted items the former cons were wearing, their blood still dripping off these items. After we give Hanamu the items and hype him up, he finally gains the confidence to become Ashkan, and he names us the Nerevarine of the Arabinism. Sweet. Only one more to go. The last tribe is the Zainab, and they have the most involved, but entertaining quest. Their wise woman tells me that their Ashkan loves designer clothes, and he wants a pair of exquisite shoes. Not expensive shoes. Not even extravagant shoes. Only exquisite shoes will do. Which we can buy from the Aldron Gucci store. The Balmora Gucci store didn't have it. Once we get him the shoes, he still isn't buying our story, and he asks us to kill a vampire in a nearby tomb to prove ourselves. So we kill the vampire, and return after a short dungeon clearing. But even that isn't enough for this guy, and he then asks us to find him a Telvani wife who's thick in the hips as a gift. I ask the wise woman on how to find a wife for this horny squit, and she comes up with a pretty wild plan. She tells us to go to Telarun and meet with her slave master friend, who will sell us a Dunmer girl slave who we will dress up with fine clothes, and Telvani bug musk, to trick the Ashkan into thinking she's a Telvani noble. This is definitely the best Ashlander quest as its concept is pretty absurd, and it plays around with Dumber society in a pretty interesting way, and it requires more than one task before the clan is ready to name you the incarnate of their greatest folk hero. So we buy the clothes, the bug musk, and the girl, and we gussy her up for the Ashkan, and lead her back to the camp. We then introduce her to the Ashkan, who is a little disappointed that she isn't a big beautiful mer, but he'll take her regardless, and he finally names us the Nerevarine. And with that, that's five of the seven trials complete. All that's left is to procure Kagernak's tools and take down Dagoth Ur. This part of the main quest, although feeling a bit rushed, as you can go from a homeless immigrant to the incarnate of four clans and war master of three gray houses in just a few days' time, still fits really well into the cultures and lore of these factions. No house besides the Radorns put any real stock into naming a Hortator. The Lalu counselors just use it as a way to get extra cash off of you or to try to kill you and the Telvani counselors don't even give a cat's ass about a Hortator. And it's pretty funny for guys like Neloth to be like, okay, fine, I'll vote for you as Hortator. Now please fuck off. It tracks extremely well with these characters' personalities and their overall house cultures, even if it is a bit underdeveloped and quick. But now we can return to the Urshalaku camp, where Nabani tells us that the high priest of the temple wishes to speak with us. And now that we have support of the tribes in the houses, we cannot be ignored anymore. So I head on over to Vivek City. I try to speak with Archcanon Saryoni, but he's behind a locked door. So I had to commit a crime to open it up, which got me expelled from the temple, which means that I can't use any of their services or talk to any of their members until I reconcile with the temple leader. But at least we can talk to Saryoni now. Saryoni says that the current Dagoth Earth situation is coming to a head, and we should speak with Vivek in person to plan our next move. Vivek is an insanely fascinating character, and it's an awesome moment to come face to face with one of the gods of the tribunal. Vivek's presence is felt everywhere in this game, with the whole massive city named after him, the multiple statues, and his 36 Lessons of Vivek book series being some of the most famous books in the entire Elder Scrolls series, being these bizarre metaphorical stories about Vivek's life, and we can learn all about how he took Daedric backshots from his husband Molag Ball for 88 days, and he had chopped Molag Ball's dick off during a Daedric spear measuring contest to make his legendary spear Muatra. No joke. This shit is so high concept and hard to read. It's been a popular rumor that Marwin's writer Michael Kirkbride had written the 36 lessons of Vivek while in a drug-induced haze while he was barricaded inside his own apartment. But this is all just a hoax. All he needed to write the 36 lessons was a theology degree and maybe some Jack Daniels. But anyway, Daedric Dick aside, Vivek tells us that he has decided to stop the persecution of the Nereverine, and he will instead work with us to gather Kagernak's tools and to stop Dagoth Ur for good. He has the first tool, Wraithguard, on his person. A gauntlet that lets the wearer survive the handling of the tools, as they will obliterate your ass if you try equipping Keening or Sunder without it. He also tells us the plan to defeat Dagother, which seems pretty complex. We must gather Keening and Sunder from two Dwemer fortresses in Red Mountain, and defeat Dagother's Ash Vampire Brethren to weaken him, and then we must assault his fortress, find the heart, and hit it once with Sunder, and then wail on it with Keening until it's destroyed. And we should call on help from the Ordinators and Vivek's personal troops, the Boyan Armagers, for help but the destruction of the heart will also mean that the tribunal will lose their divinity, 
showing just how desperate the Tribunal are to stop Dagother. We could also talk to Vivek for some interesting insights on his godhood, and how he describes that he feels half awake and half asleep, and he can slip into a divine realm where everything is occurring all at the same time, removed from all time and space. It's pretty fascinating stuff. A big part about what makes Elder Scrolls lore so interesting is its heavy themes of divinity, creation, and the conflicting but interesting legends about how the world and its races were made, and how mortals interact with the gods, and it's at its best in Marwood. We can also ask him about what happened in Nerevar, and he will still deny that the Tribunal had assassinated him. Whether he's telling the truth, lying, or perhaps even just forgotten the truth out of guilt is unclear, but it's a really interesting question to think about. He will say that Nerevar's murder was a story spread by a former S.H.I.E.L.D. companion of Nerevar, whose account of the Tribunal assassinating him had spread amongst the Ashlanders he lived with, and whether he's telling the truth again is unclear. But it's super cool to me to learn about the origin of the Nerevarian prophecies, and just how legends can grow over time, much like in real life. We can also learn the full scope of Dagothur's plans from Vivek. It seems that Dagothur has been copying Kagranak's homework, and is using the heart to build a second Numidium called Akulakan. Using this oversized living statue, Dagoth plans to drive out the Mongol dogs of the Empire and the Enwad of Marwind, and to destroy the false gods of the Tribunal, where he will then move on to establishing a six-house empire across Tamriel, where everyone lives as a faceless or a Cthulhu-looking ash peon under his divine rule. Sounds wonderful. But once we're done chatting with Vivek, our final goal is to enter Red Mountain and to complete the previously mentioned tasks. The game makes it seem like this final push into Red Mountain to get the tools and assault Dagother will be a much longer and involved process, but in reality, it's just clearing out two fairly short dungeons to get the tools, and then taking on Dagother himself. The devs are probably just looking to finish up the main quest to get the game out on time, and how to scale back their original plans for the war with Dagother, leaving us with the pretty short and straightforward final act of this main quest. So we head on over to Ghostgate, and inside, we can find an old soldier named Wolf, who will ask us to carry an old coin with us when we take on Dagother and it's heavily implied that Wolf is an avatar of the man turned god himself, Talos, which is really, really cool. It's pretty subtle, and maybe his coin is his way to observe the upcoming monumental battle between the Nerevarine and Dagothur firsthand. I don't think any god would want to miss that. And with all that taken care of, we can penetrate into Red Mountain. Red Mountain has a great atmosphere. The red sky and endless storms really make the place feel evil and oppressive, and it still looks great 22 years later. So we clear out the fortresses and kill the ash vampires inside, and we grab Keening and Sunder. And with these tools in hand, we're pretty much ready to take on Dagothur, and we enter his fortress of the same name. It's another tough but brief dungeon like the others on Red Mountain, full of strong six-house goons and Daedra, and the whole time we can hear Dagothur speaking to us in his sensual, buttery smooth voice. Come to me through fire and war, Nerevar. I'm just stroking my shit in the heart chamber. I got bloat all over my spear. I'm divine as fuck, my dear moon and star. His voice is just way too sexy for an elongated, immortal ash demon demigod who turns men and myrrh into walking cancer growths, but maybe that's what makes him so appealing. Maybe it's just misunderstood. Could a guy this sensual truly be so evil? But we'll learn the answer to that question real soon, as we soon come face to face with the mad dreamer himself, and he's busting a cute little jig and striking a cute little pose. We approach and have one last chat with him before our final battle, and he asks us a few questions, such as if we are truly Nerevar reborn. Well, I'm not exactly sure. Still working on that one, but Nerevar or not, I'm still whooping your ass regardless. He also asked what we would do with the heart, which is a pointless question as we have no choice but to destroy it. And finally, he asked if we would have joined him and surrendered the tools to him, which is another pointless question as it's impossible to join the Sixth House. We can then ask him questions of our own, mostly about his plans that we already know about, but we can also ask him what happened to the Dwemer, and even he doesn't know where they went. But with that talk over, Dagothur says he will let us have the first strike, as we are his guests. This is a lie, however, as Dagoth Ur will try to pull a fast one and will immediately begin attacking you after the dialogue is over. More like Dagoth Ur fucking lion. Yeah, good cool. one. Dagoth is a tough beast being the final boss and all, and if you left some of his ash vampires alive, he will have stronger stats in your battle. But you kill five of the seven ash vampires during the main quest, so having one or two still alive is usually no big deal. Using Chrysomir, he goes down pretty quickly and vanishes. We proceed into the heart chamber, where we find Dagoth Ur again but now he's invincible in this room, as he's really close to the heart itself. So we ignore him and start running down the long spiraling path around a Kulakan, which looks less like a mech and more like a giant statue with... human bones jutting out of it? Not sure where he got that ribcage from, but once we cross the bridge to the heart, and when we approach it, we perform the sequence outlined in Vivek's plan. Hit it once with Sunder, and wail on it with Keening until we induce a divine heart attack and destroy it. And this part was a little crusty for me, as Dagothur will teleport behind you when you start whacking the heart, and he ended up killing me a few times while I was trying to destroy it. 
but I eventually get it to work, and the heart is destroyed, and Dagoth Earth takes a cartoonish fall off the bridge and disappears from this plane of existence, but not before lamenting how absolutely over it is for him. Too late. This is the end. The bitter, bitter end. We then have to make our escape and run back to the entrance as the Kulikot crumbles, and the heart was still floating out where it was originally for me, but I think this was just a visual bug from one of my mods. Before we leave, we see a specter of Azura appear before us, who congratulates us for destroying the heart and fulfilling the prophecy, and she gives us her ring, and our reward for completing the main quest and finally ending the several thousand year long threat of Dagoth Ur? A ring that gives us 20 points Night Eye, and a 3 points Enhanced Stamina Regeneration. Pretty weak, Azura. I guess you had to really dig deep in the Daedric Dresser for that one, huh? But it's better than nothing, I suppose. Fatigue Regeneration is pretty helpful in getting around faster, so that's nice. But with that, that's the end of the main quest of Marwyn. I love the story on offer here. It's so interesting to learn about the factions, their beliefs, and the history of the Dunmer and the Tribunal. And I'm a really big fan of how uncertain and unclear the details surrounding what happened on Red Mountain are, and how the current day beliefs of Vardenfell are derived from this one event. It's very true to how real life mythologies and histories can be obfuscated and morph into new cultures, religions, and so on based on hearsay and belief in a certain sequence of events, regardless to the truth of the matter. The game respects your intelligence and puts the onus on the player to engage in dialogue, read the historical and religious texts, and come to your own conclusions as to what most likely happened all those years ago on Red Mountain. And if we truly are Nerevar brought back to life, or we're just a really successful pretender. And it's all great stuff. Dagoth Ur is one of my favorite villains in gaming. He's got a solid plan and is probably justified in destroying the Tribunal. And his role as a mad god kept alive by his connection to the heart is super fascinating. And he feels like a true threat throughout the game. And his presence is felt almost everywhere, from the crazed dreamers in towns to the more in-your-face blood-red ash storms. He's everything this story needs him to be, and more. And that voice is just so sensual. Just stroking Ugh. my shit. As for the gameplay itself, the main quest offers up a great combination of dungeon delving and world exploring, sending you to major cities to learn the culture and histories, and to see the interesting characters and unique locations this game has to offer. And the caves, ruins, and strongholds you visit are challenging and varied. My only issue with the main quest is that it starts to get faster and looser as you go on, and the final offensive against Dagoth Ur in the Sixth House feels pretty short and rushed, and that was probably due to external factors on the devs rather than poor design. But overall, there's a lot of great stuff on offer here, and I recommend any Elder Scrolls fan to play this one through. You won't be disappointed, and you'll probably feel really satisfied with yourself for doing it. I was definitely feeling a little jacked my first time completing this game, but with the main story complete, that's not all there is to Marwyn, as you likely purchased the Game of the Year edition with the game's two expansions, Tribunal and Blood Moon. So let's take a look at Tribunal first, as it is an extension of the main quest. Tribunal starts pretty early on for most players, as when you rest, you have a chance of being jumped by a Dark Brotherhood assassin. Technically, they aren't supposed to jump you until you're level 6, but the PC version is bugged, and the assassins will be on your ass from day 1. Once you kill one, you'll get pointed to report the attack to Apelles Matius in Ebonheart, who will then point us towards a Seen Rain, who will teleport us to Mornhold to start the expansion proper. Mornhold, City of Light, City of Magic. Mornhold is a really cool location, and I really like the jade green colors, the unique architecture, and the sweet sets of armor the guards and ordinators are wearing, and it really stands out from the base game. Although the area itself is kind of small, as there are only five main areas in Mornhold. The Royal Palace, the Temple of Almalexia, the God's Reach Residential District, Plaza Brindisi Doram, and the Great Bazaar, which is the best place in Mornhold, as it's home to some pretty useful merchants with solid gold reserves. These guys have like five to 10,000 gold each. Nice. I was coming here often to restock on exclusive restore health potions, as you're gonna need them. Tribunal is extremely challenging at parts, and it spikes real hard in difficulty at times. Tribunal contains two main quest lines, one for the royal family, and the other for Amalexia and the temple. And despite coming here to get my lick back against some Dark Brotherhood thugs, I actually first started doing work for the temple, and we can do that by talking to Fedris Hilaire to get started on the main quest. Our first mission is to destroy a goblin army being trained in the sewers and caves beneath Mornhold. Since we can't really do any fighting on the surface outside of some select instances, most of the fighting and exploring takes place in the underground sewers of Old Mornhold, which are hit or miss. Some of the caves are full of old buildings and shrines, which are really cool to explore, while the sewers are much more bland and samey, feeling more like a maze than anything else. Hilaire tells us that Hualu Helseth, the new king of Morrowind, is building a goblin army right underneath our feet, which is a bit of an odd choice for Helseth to build an army out of unloyal, violent monsters. But whatever, I'm not the king. So we head down to the sewers to exterminate their two war chiefs and their two Altmer drainers. Battling the goblins will show you pretty quickly that the difficulty is taking a solid step up in this expansion, as the goblins are tough, hit damn hard, and they can easily gang up on you. Getting ganged up on in Morrowind is pretty much a death sentence, as the overlapping enemy attacks will obliterate your health bar insanely fast. 
Also, enemy attacks really start shredding your armor at this point in the game. So you also will need to make sure that you have a solid stock of armorer's hammers to make those post-combat repairs. Even just one or two goblins can put in some serious punishment on your gear. But once we take down the goblin chiefs and their two altmer trainers in some very tough fights, the war chiefs can use strong magic and physical attacks, and those exclusive restore health potions were the only thing keeping me from ascending to a Therius. So thank you, Mornhole Potion Shop, for keeping the Nerevarine prophecy alive. We then return to Hilaire, who will pay you a war chest of 15,000 gold if you eliminate both Altmer trainers. And you'll need that money for potions and repairs. So be sure to kill those piss elves. While we're down here, we can also find the Dark Brotherhood cell who tried to murk us at level 1. So I pay them back in full and perform a cleansing of the goons down here. And I also kill their leader. And on his body, we can find a note commissioning our assassination from someone only known as H. H? Like maybe... Homalexia? Nah, it's just Helseth. Who else? We'll have to confront him about this later. Next, we can do more work for the Arch Cannon, who will send us to take a cowardly temple healer to cleanse a shrine back down in the sewers, which is currently overrun by a gang squad of liches. So I bait out the liches and kill them one by one, and I get the priest to cleanse the shrine, and we return to the temple to complete the quest. We speak to the Arch Cannon again, who sends us back down into the sewers yet again to get the mazed ring from the lich Berylzar. Berylzar is a real prick. He will blind you on hit, and he's got another lich to back him up. So just keep chugging those potions and swing at the darkness and you'll make it through just fine. Once we have the maze ban, we can deliver it to Almalexia herself, who looks a little... odd. But regardless, she thanks us for our work and tells us that hopefully one day we can be of service to her again. Wink. Nudge. And sure enough, about a day later, the next time we enter the plaza, we will find a bunch of robot dinosaur looking creatures called the Fabricants attacking the guards. We help take them down and report back to Almalexia, who tells us to speak with Hilaire who then tells us to investigate the entrance to a Dwemer ruin that has opened up in the plaza where the statue used to be. So we head on over and observe the fabricants tussling with the Dwemer automatons down there, and we run back to report to Amalexia again. When we report to her, she asks us to switch gears and investigate a doomsday cult called the End of Times. And when we speak to their leader, he does some teasing for Oblivion, raving about how the Dage will invade Tamriel soon. He knows. We tell Amalexia about what we learned about the cult, and she hatches a real harebrained scheme to counter them. She needs to flex her divine power, so she tasks us with going into the newly opened Dwemer ruins to go turn on a weather machine to generate a blight storm that'll envelop Mornhold, standing as a monument to her power. How the hell did she know that there was a weather machine down there? But anyway, we do as we're asked, and we head into the ruins. And these ruins are pretty hard, but only when fighting the Archer Spheres, as for some reason these bastards could one-shot me with their bolts, so I had to do some shimmying and slashing to take them down while trying to dodge the bolts. But the ruin itself is pretty cool. It's pretty large, and there's ash piles and items on the ground, implying that's where the dwarves were standing when they got scorched out of existence. And there's some impressive Dwemer technology down here, like this large mech, and most impressively, Dwemer ceiling fans. But to get to the weather machine, we have to do another key pixel hunt, which can be found on a desk, which opens a door that contains two dwarven satchel charges in a room. We can use this dwarven C4 to destroy some rock cave-ins, and one leads us to the weather machine room. I fiddle with the levers until I see the journal update pop up, which means I did it right, and I return to the surface, which is now getting blasted by an ash storm. We return to Alm of the Civi, and she then tasks us with killing her former hand and head of guard, who was milling about in God's Reach. Also, every time I had to go to the temple, I also had to dodge this ebony armored prick who was trying to chase me down and kill me. This is Gaynor, and in my past videos, I've mentioned times where I wasn't sure if the game was trolling the player, but with Gaynor, there's no question that this is Bethesda just trolling us. We can meet Gaynor outside the temple, who will ask you for repeated donations that can get comically large, up to a million coins at its max. But when you refuse to donate to him, he will get pissed and swear revenge on you, and return the next day kitted out in full ebony armor. Now this doesn't really seem that bad, until you realize that Gaynor has 755 luck, making him extremely hard to hit on top of some pretty other powerful effects he has. And I just didn't want to deal with him at the time, so every trip to the temple meant I also had to run away from this guy, and the guards are completely unbothered by this thug assaulting me on sight in broad daylight. At least you couldn't catch me in my boots, though. But tangent aside, back to the main quest. Make sure that you're stocked up on health and fatigue potions before fighting this guy, as Almalexia's hand is an absolute beast. He's dripped out in some powerful enchanted armor, he can drain your fatigue, and is an absolute fridge of health, and was easily two-shotting me. And to beat him, I had to chug gallons of potions to keep me from getting killed in under three seconds, and I'm surprised my Nerevarine wasn't pissing his pants during the fight from all the liquids I drank. But once you manage to take him down, your reward is all the sweet-ass armor he's wearing. But just be careful not to talk to any Ordinators when wearing their armor, as they'll attack you on sight for stealing their fit. And once that's done, Almalexia will task us with rebuilding Nerevar's legendary sword True Flame, 
and we will get one of the pieces from her. The second piece is in the possession of Helsa's bodyguard, so we have to progress his side of the quest to get that piece. We return to the palace and finally come face to face with Helseth, and when we confront him about him sending assassins to kill us, he just brushes it off as a simple mistake, saying that he heard some fake news about me being a potential threat. Just a misunderstanding. No big deal. Happens all the time. I mean, I get it. One time I heard that my brother had stolen my PlayStation 5, so I hired a hitman to kill him for $20,000. But interestingly, my brother ended up killing the hitman in self-defense. But it turns out, it was my dad who took it the whole time. <laughs> we all had a big laugh after that. But brushing off attempts made on my life aside, Helseth asks us to get information from his orc informant about a possible assassination attempt on his mother, Baron Zaya. So we get the info from the orc, and we move to protect Baron Zaya from three fairly beefy Dark Brotherhood assassins. And it's cool to help out such a huge character in the lore. I've seen all those books about Baron Zaya's life, so it's really cool to see her in person. And once we foil the assassination, we can finally have our duel with Helseth's bodyguard, Karad. And it's a fairly easy battle compared to some of the other bosses in this expansion. And once we beat him, we get the second piece of True Flame. And to get the final piece, we need to donate two artifacts to the museum, which is easier said than done, as the museum pays super well for artifacts. I was able to sell off my beloved Chrysomir for 30,000 septums, which funded me for pretty much the rest of the game. So once I donate two artifacts, the curator gives me a shield with a piece of True Flame stuck in it, and we bring it to the Orth Smithmaster at the crafting hall, who takes out the fragment and restores the sword but the sword is still missing its flame enchantment. And to restore the flame to the sword, we need to head back down into the Dwemer ruins and speak to the ghost of Radax Stugginthums, who says he needs some pyroyal tar to restore the flame to the sword, which can be found in the connecting Daedric Citadel that's near the end of the ruin. We can get the tar off of Dramora, who is backed up by a full squad of Daedric minions, so get ready for another brutal fight. But once he's dead, we can take the tar off his corpse and return it to Radax Ghost, who restores true flame to its full glory. It's a pretty strong and unique looking sword, and I used it pretty much exclusively from here on. But with the legendary sword reforged, we can return to Almalexia, who tells us what's going on with all the recent occurrences. She says that Sothasil has gone mad, and is responsible for the Fabricant attack, and she asks us to go to his clockwork city to confront him. Be sure that you're well stocked up on potions and repair hammers before going, as the Fabricants in the clockwork city will shred your gear durability, and you cannot leave once you enter, and you run the risk of getting overextended and completely stuck. But once you're ready, Almalexia will teleport you there right away. The Clockwork City is another really cool place lore-wise, it being Sotha Sil's own personal realm of Dwemer influence mechanics and technology, and the city itself being a giant moving mechanism. And it's a pretty good endgame dungeon that has you do some puzzle solving on top of some combat. And near the end you fight an honest to god mech called the Imperfect in another tough but engaging battle. And it isn't super long or overly complex, but it's got some really awesome lore and design to it and it really stands out in the Elder Scrolls series, even to this day. But once we reach the final dome, we find Sil the Sil, and he looks completely foobarred. We find his strung up body dangling from wires, lifelessly swaying in the center of the room. When we turn to leave, we are then confronted by Almalexia, who reveals the truth of the matter. Having been driven to the brink by her waning divinity, she had used the maze band to travel to the Clockwork City and kill Sil the Sil, and to stage the Fabricant attack. And then she would use us as a martyr for herself, Planning to claim that the Nerevarine had died in combat with the mad Sotha Sil, which would shore up support for herself while eliminating all loose ends. But we could have seen this coming a mile away. Almalexia acts extremely odd and vindictively throughout the entire questline, and several NPCs will comment on how Almalexia has become crueler and more aloof over time. It's not much of a real twist. But then she engages us in combat, and at this point, all my recent saves have been overwritten, and I was in too deep to go back, and I only had one potion left. So I may or may not have turned down the difficulty a bit to complete this battle. But she's another tough as nails fight, casting powerful destruction spells and attacking with her own legendary sword Hope's Fire. But like all the others, she falls before me, and I snatch the ring in Hope's Fire, and I use the ring to teleport out of the Clockwork City and go back to the temple. This maze band fucks, as you can use it to teleport to Mornhold or Vivek City from anywhere, and it's great for quickly returning to Mornhold to restock on health potions and repair hammers. And once we leave the temple, we're greeted again by Azura, who commends us for our work on taking out Almalexia, and tells us that the time of the tribunal is finally coming to an end, and they can finally return to their original Daedric faith. And with that, that's the main quest of Tribunal Complete. Although the story is a bit scattered and pretty predictable, I still enjoyed it. Almalexia's madness and desperation is pretty compelling, if a bit obvious, and it's a cool way of exploring how a god would react to losing their powers. The combat is a great late game challenge, and the city of Mornholt still looks great and visually interesting, and places like the museum and the bazaar are extremely useful for money and strong potions. And there are several side quests to do on top of it all. It gets a lot out of its limited real estate, even if that means repeated sewer diving. But I found those underground caverns and sewers to be interesting and dangerous just enough to be enjoyable. 
despite the relative sameness of those areas. And I really liked obtaining the weapons True Flame and Hope's Fire, and visiting lore-heavy places like the Clockwork City is a great time, albeit a very hard and armor-destroying one. Overall, I think Tribunal is a worthwhile endgame challenge that's held up by its memorable setting and its pretty impactful story of the fall of the Tribunal was interesting to watch unfold. We get to see two gods get offed, so that's pretty cool. Don't really get to see that every day. But its limited area and lack of real meatiness leave it as more of an extension rather than an expansion. But with that, we can move on to a more traditional expansion, Blood Moon. Blood Moon adds the frozen rock of an island we know as Solstheim, which we can reach from a boat and cool, but you can also fly over to it if you want, as Solstheim is not separate from the game's world. Once we arrive at the Imperial outpost Fort Frostmoth, we can speak to General Fox Karaius to kick off the main quest, and he asks us to investigate low troop morale. By talking to the guards and offering them some Cyrodiilic brandy, we learn that the fort had recently become a dry fort, and alcohol shipments have stopped coming in for some reason. And after investigating the shrine at the fort, we can find that the Imperial priest had taken the alcohol and hid it in his desk, in a short-sighted attempt to get the troops to revolt so he could get sent home. But we narc on him to Falks, who keeps him stationed here as punishment. Didn't work out for him. Next, he wants us to investigate a smuggling ring amongst his troops, and he asks us to recruit one of two soldiers to help us. We can see some elements of later Elder Scrolls design in this expansion. Characters have more things to say in context through voice lines, and there's a bigger emphasis on working with companions. So we ask around for info about the smuggling, and after bribing the smith, he tells us to take a look into the nearby cave, which we clear out. And when we return, we find that the four has been attacked by wolf-like creatures, and Falks Karaius has been abducted by the mysterious attackers. So the remaining Imperials tell me to make contact with the local Nor tribe, the Skull, to see if they know anything about the recent attack. So we head on over, and strike out into Solstheim proper. Although Solstheim isn't very big, it feels very dense. The forests are huge and detailed, so detailed that I was running into some performance issues while exploring and fighting in the woods, but I think that was caused by my graphics overhaul mod. There are enemies literally all over the place. You can barely go 30 seconds without getting jumped by wolves, bears, bristlebacks, Nordic witch women, berserkers in their underwear, or little blue goblin men called the Reichlings. It does make Solstein feel dangerous, but also kind of crowded. You'll slaughter enough bears and wolves to make a football field-sized pelt blanket by the time you're done here. And it's funny to go from the bizarre landscape of Vardenfell and its alien bug dogs and two-legged lizards that are 80% mouth, to the normal-looking barren wolf-inhabited snowy mountains landscape. But it works, as this relatively normal-looking area feels unfamiliar, and dare I say alien, after spending so much time on Vardenfell. Once we reach the Skull Village, we talk to their leader, Tharsten Hartfang, about the attack. And the Skull aren't sure who the attacking monsters are either, but he says that they have other issues to deal with, and we must restore the oneness of Solstheim, and we must speak to the Skull Shaman for more info. We speak to the Shaman, who gives us the story of Avar Stonesinger, and a map of the six standing stones on the island. It's probably the best quest in the entire expansion, and it has you following the steps outlined in the story to restore all six stones power, and we get a grand tour of the island along the way. You'll do a deep dive into an underwater cave, help a spirit bear, open up the greedy man's sack, unleash the sun from ice in a cave using the eye of a beast you killed, and steal seeds from a reikling in his spring and harem, and hit some farting rocks. It's an interesting way of having you perform the trials while immersing yourself in skull folklore, and the directions are given to you in the form of a story, and it's really dope to have to recreate the aspects of the story as part of the quest, and it's got a lot for you to do. It'll take you a minute to complete all the trials, but once the stones are all restored, we can return to the skull, who then tasks us with solving a crime to prove our wisdom. Engar Icemane has been accused of stealing furs from Rigmore Halfhand, and after a short investigation, we learn from a note that Rigmore had a thing for Engar's wife, and had planted the furs as a way of removing him from the picture, so he could give her the pipe. But we confront him about his scheme, and take him to Tharsten, who lets us decide to either exile Rigmore, or feed him to the wolves. Damn. I decided to exile him. No honorable wolf death for you, buddy. And with that, we have proven our wisdom to the Skull, and we now get access to Rigmore's house as a new player home. Sweet. A new flop house. Next, we need to test our strength, so we meet with the shaman at the shores of Lake Fjalding, which currently has a pillar of fire spewing out of it. Probably not a good sign. And he tasks us with entering the underwater lake cave and killing a Draugr lord named Aislip. A Draugr, huh? Don't worry. I played Skyrim. I've been slaughtering Draugr for a decade. This will be light work. But when we find the Draugr, he's much chiller than expected, telling us that he is down here to contain a horde of frost Atronachs that would slaughter the skull if let loose. So we team up with him and clear out the Atronachs in the cave below in a pretty challenging dungeon clear. And once they're dead, Aislip can finally die in peace, and we get his ring and return to the Skull Village. We try talking to Tharsten, but soon the Skull Village is attacked by werewolves. Oh fuck, I wasn't ready for this. I hope they aren't too- oh look how short they are. Despite their stature, don't let their size fool you. These werewolves are fucking juiced. 
they have a ton of health, making them pretty tough to take down, even with True Flame and Hope's Fire. And they got the meatiest hands in the game. These bastards were easily two-shotting me and were constantly knocking me out of my ass, which usually meant certain death. But not only that, they also obliterate your armor's durability. They were even able to destroy my boots of blinding speed in one hit pretty often. Late game Morrowind is not friendly to your gear at all, so always be sure you have repair hammers on deck. But once we take down the werewolves, the shaman returns and tells us that we have been infected with lycanthropy, and we will turn into a werewolf in three days time. This is the major choice of this expansion, as you can either heal your werewolfitis and side with the skull, or you can just let that shit incubate and become a werewolf and side with her scene. Being a werewolf is nuts in Blood Moon. You run really fast and jump incredibly high, and you are also extremely durable and strong. Your werewolf attacks will shred your opponent's health. It's pretty nuts and pretty overpowered. But if you don't want to join Hercene's side, you can still become a werewolf after the main quest when you get your paws on the ring of Hercene, which will let you transform into a werewolf whenever you want. And I decided to help out the Skull, as I wasn't really looking to become a bloodthirsty beast in the service of a furry loving god. So I cured my lycanthropy and returned to the Skull Village. Next, I need to grab the Totem of Claw and Fang from a nearby crypt. And the next three missions will be different based on if you decide to become a werewolf or not. For the Totem mission, if you're a Skull, you just clear out the dungeon of werewolves and get the Totem. If you're a werewolf, you need to defend the Totem from Skull attackers who will try to take it. After that, we have to perform the Restock, a ceremonial hunt of a spirit bear. If you're Skull, you need to just follow the hunt leader and fight off the werewolves that spawn up your ass cheeks at the end of the quest. If you're a werewolf, it's the opposite, and you have to kill the hunters. And finally, we have to investigate Castle Karstag, a giant ice castle home to a frost giant king and his Reichling minions, as we need to investigate Horkers getting killed en masse on the northern shores of the island. It's another pretty cool quest, having you kill these tusk monsters called the Grawls, and they all look pretty intimidating and alien in the dark tunnels below the castle. It looks really cool. But we join up with Krish the Reichling, kill the Grawls, and enter Castle Karstag to find Karstag missing. And we also learn that he got abducted by werewolves, so he isn't the cause of the dead Horkers. So we return to the Skull Shaman, who says that all the signs are pointing towards the coming of the Blood Moon Prophecy. Huh, no kidding. And once you talk to him, the next time you rest, you will be abducted by werewolves. So make sure you are totally prepared before resting, as this area is probably the most difficult combat gauntlet in the entire game, not just the DLCs. So only rest when you are fully, fully ready. Make a manual save and everything. This maze is not fucking around. And once we get kidnapped, we are taken to a daedric ruin beneath Mortrag Glacier and come face to face with Hercene, who tells us that he has kidnapped us, Fox Karaz, Tharsten, and Karstak to all participate in Hercene's hunt, where only one will emerge victorious and claim Hercene's ring. And we enter the maze, where we can no longer rest or teleport away until we clear it. This werewolf gangbang maze is some seriously devious shit from the devs. There are over a dozen werewolves per area, and all the werewolves are extremely powerful, each one being stronger than Dagoth Ur, and they can easily gank you in these claustrophobic hallways, literally running over each other to maul your ass. We can get backup from Falks and later Tharsten, but they don't offer a ton of extra support, and it's very easy to attack them instead. Companion combat is pretty crusty in all of Morrowind, but overall, it's an absolute slog. You'll be repairing your gear after every werewolf fight and chugging potions constantly, so make sure you have a really deep stock of them. But after some determination, and maybe, or maybe not, knocking down the difficulty slider a notch or two, we fight through the werewolves with Falks, and then with Tharsten. But before we move on to the final area, Tharsten reveals that he is a werewolf, in possession of Hercene's ring, and morphs up and attacks us. I do this pooch in old yeller style, and we can get his ring automatically after killing him. Sweet. Doggy time. We get out of the maze and we enter an area that is thankfully werewolf free. But we now have to take on Karstag himself, who has a really cool design to him. What a weirdo. Karstag hits hard, but he's pretty much on par with any given werewolf from the gangbang we just escaped, so he's surprisingly light work. And with Karstag dead, we can then see Hercene again, who challenges us to a final combat challenge with a smaller, weaker version of himself. He's got some tricky paralysis attacks, but again, like Karstag, he's still not that much stronger than any given werewolf, so he's also pretty light work to slaughter as well. But with Hercene's avatar slain, we get a cutscene of the glacier imploding, and Hercene saying that the Blood Moon will come again but not for another several hundred years. He needs to recover and rest from the working I gave his avatar. But with that, that's the end of the Blood Moon main quest. It's a pretty good collection of interesting and fun missions, especially the Standing Stone and Castle Karstad quests. They provide a lot of new areas to explore and some late game combat to engage in, even if the werewolves felt a little overpowered at times. The story has a cool concept, but it doesn't have too much depth to it. The Blood Moon prophecy has a cool Nordic folk angle to it, but the actual prophecy seems a little inconsequential. Seems like Hercene gets a little bored and decides he wants to watch some stronger than average mortals do a little werewolf battle royale thing. 
and it's like he's watching Daedric Twitch TV or something. But overall, it's a very fun main quest with some pretty great rewards, and the Ring of Hercene alone justifies doing the quests, even if the story feels a little loose and inconsequential. But that's not all there is to do on Solstheim, as you can also do a questline to build up the Raven Rock Mining Colony for the East Empire Company, and perform a series of short but novel quests to build up the town, like killing this guy so hard he explodes. And I really liked watching the town get built up over time, and it culminates in a pretty large player home for yourself. Sweet. Another, bigger flop house. And there's even some player choice involved, as you can either work for Falco to build up the town in good faith, or sabotage its success by working for Carnius. But why you'd want to work for the greedy, lazy, vindictive businessman Carnius is beyond me. And if you side with Falco, you end up killing Carnius' cheap ass anyway. But just be careful. This lowly businessman has a powerful Stalrim mace, and he has more health than Dagoth Ur. Maybe this guy should have been Nerevarine. Goddamn. But overall, it's a great little side quest line. And this quest line is on top of a bevy of side quests like killing the Uderfricta, finding any traces of the Falmer, and so on and on. Blood Moon is a much meatier expansion than Tribunal, and Solstheim itself feels like a unique and dense location, full of fun quests, tough challenges, and only a little bit of bullshit. And it really set the bar for Elder Scrolls DLCs going forward. But with that, that's all the major Morrowind content I wanted to take a look at. I gained more and more appreciation for this game with each playthrough, and I think I had the most fun yet on this one. Morrowind, despite its age and technical limitations, really scratches that itch only the Elder Scrolls can provide me, and its emphasis on player freedom to build any character they like, as well as coming up with new spells and enchantments and creative ways to use them, or to counter tough enemies, to just straight up breaking the game and pushing magic to its absolute limits, and becoming a demigod in the process our experiences only Morrowind can provide, and that's on top of a deep and interesting RPG system, with some pretty challenging and strategic combat once you really get familiar with all its systems. It's got an extremely fascinating and alien world, and incredibly well-written stories and lore that'll keep you immersed and engrossed in the setting, history, and people long after you're done playing. And it's just stuffed with almost endless amounts of locations, factions, side quests, and treasure to find, and dungeons to clear. It's awesome. And I'd recommend anyone at least try Morrowind, especially if Starfield got you yearning for the glories of days past. But that's all I got for you today. Another tome of a script. Goddamn. It's like an hour and a half and five minutes. It's just longer and longer, I guess. Well, anyway... I hope you enjoyed this video if you made it this far, because I enjoyed you watching it. And thank you very much yet again. I love you all. Goodbye.